So tonight, September 5th, 2021, probably the most historic pay-per-view in the history of All Elite Wrestling. We're going to talk about it here on this video. AEW All Out 2021 from Chicago, Illinois. Um, the debut in the ring of CM Punk, his first wrestling match in seven years. And on top of that... The shocking, even though if you're following my Twitter and if you're following the rumors of the business, you know it's not really a big shocker to you. The appearance, the first appearance in AEW of WrestleMania main eventer Daniel Bryan, going by his real name Bryan Danielson, and Adam Cole, baby, who was just on WWE TV, what, three weeks ago for NXT? He is now a member of AEW. We're going to talk all about it here. Um, this show was the best AEW pay-per-view of 2021. Now, was it the best ever? i got to think about that because 2019 had some really good ones. And even Revolution 2020 was great. But I, I have to think about it a bit more. But this was, without a doubt, the best show they put on this year. You had a lot of good matches. You had a lot of good moments. And it was fun overall and a great crowd in Chicago. I was actually getting emotional earlier today because I really wanted to be there in Chicago. I really did. And I'm not going to miss this again. Next year, I will go to Chicago for AEW All Out or whatever show I want to go to. I might even go to the full gear pay-per-view coming up in Philadelphia because I really want to see AEW again live. I'm actually going to Dynamite next month, but um, in Orlando, Florida. But let's talk about this show. So, this show gave you a lot of variety. A lot of different things. You had a little bit of, of, of like, hardcore, like, lucha wackiness. You had a little bit of, like, really good, solid in-ring wrestling. You had psychology in some matches. You had a battle royal. So, the show really delivered a mixed bag for a lot of wrestling fans. And now things are getting very exciting because within the span of a month, WWE, well, I'm sorry, AEW has gotten... Three very important people in the history of wrestling uh, of the modern era. CM Punk, Brian Danielson, and now Adam Cole. And all these guys have very strong fan bases. All these guys are very important to the business, at least for the modern era. And you're going to have some fans compare this to like what happened in 96 with WCW, Hall and Nash. It's not going to be on that level. Because nobody in the wrestling business is on the level of Hulk Hogan back then. So when Hogan turned and joined the, and started the NWO, like nobody's on that level. Because Hogan's just a different level of star, right? But when it comes to like this current era of wrestling and what wrestling's kind of become, CM Punk is probably the closest to that. With the exception of somebody like a John Cena or a Rock. As far as like pure like mainstream popularity, especially since... Cena and Rock have been doing some really huge movies for the past few years. Punk is not on that level, but Punk is beloved by the wrestling fans, right? We know this. And I believe that with the addition of Cole and Brian, you've got a really, really stacked roster right now in AEW. You have a lot of fresh matchups for all these guys. You have a lot of fresh angles you can run. And you have what seems to be a time in wrestling that's getting very, very exciting. Now, in addition to those three talents, we also had the debut of Ruby Riot, the former Ruby Riot, now Ruby Soho. We had New Japan Pro Wrestling's Minoru Suzuki, one of my favorite wrestlers. He was also here, and the return of the Butcher. So they brought a lot of people back. They had a ton of surprises, with the idea being that they're going to have a bigger audience now in AEW because of the... Uh, influx of, of new viewers because of CM Punk. So the strategy Tony Khan is trying to implement here is to get the fans who were WWE Labs fans who wanted to see these guys to all jump over to AEW and to inflate that television audience. They want to get the big ratings every week, and so they stacked this show up. Some could say, you know, maybe they should have waited till the New York show or maybe they should have waited until later, but I understand the strategy, so I'm very curious to see how the news will work this week, and I'm curious to see what the ratings are going to be for Dynamite this week, because it could be huge. I'm expecting a big rating. How big? I'm not really sure, but I am expecting it to go up a little bit. So I want to go through the main card of the pay-per-view. First of all, the opening matchup, Eddie Kingston and Miro. 
I actually really liked this match. It was better than I thought it was. These guys worked a really fun match. You had lots of suplexes, lots of stiff kicks, um, very snug type of work. I never in my life years ago would have thought we'd ever see an Eddie Kingston versus Rusev match. Like I never would have expected that. And we got it, and it was a pretty good little match. And I really liked the finish with the exposed turnbuckle. The ref gets in the way, and then Miro does the low blow, and then the bicycle kick for the win. Like that was good stuff. Like I liked it. Miro is still the TNT champion. Who's going to beat him? Could it be one of the new guys? We'll see. John Moxley and Kojima was a fun Japanese style match. Lots of lariats, lots of forearms. We saw the brain buster. We saw uh, the machine gun chops in the corner. Like if you're a fan of New Japan, you got to see a really good match here. And the John Moxley, of course, is a regular in New Japan. And Kojima's been in Japan. I mean, Excalibur went over his entire history. This guy's been around forever. Um, legitimately a, um, uh, you know, a premier wrestler over there. Been around forever. They had a really fun little match. Uh, then what popped me is Kaze Ninare plays and Minoru Suzuki comes out. And Minoru Suzuki. And a lot of fans who are watching this probably have no idea who he is. This is much more of a deep cut. Minoru Suzuki is one of the most unique and badass wrestlers from New Japan. He has a very unique style, MMA influence. He makes his matches look like he's not cooperating. It's very, it's a very unique kind of um, style. Nobody wrestles like him. Like, nobody in the business wrestles like Minoru Suzuki. And him and Moxley actually had a feud last year. Um, and so... Moxley pretty much got laid out with the gotch pile driver, and that's going to lead to a match on Dynamite this week. So I'm surprised we're doing it so soon. Britt Baker versus Chris Statlander for the AEW women's title was a pretty good little women's match. They worked hard. I love that <laughs> there was a spot where, near the finish, where Britt Baker did Adam Cole's move, bro, the Panama Sunrise. You know, but she called it the Pittsburgh Sunrise. And then she hit the Alak Jaw for the submission victory. It was a good match. I knew that Statlander was not going to win. And now it looks like Ruby Riot will be getting the next shot, either on TV or at the next pay-per-view. Then we had um, we had a rap performance. Then we had the Lucha Brothers against the, uh, the Young Bucks for the AEW World Tag Team titles in a cage match. Now, I was there for the latter match two years ago at All Out. And that was a very good match. Um, I actually probably like that one a bit more than this one. But this match was wacky and crazy. So this is the kind of wrestling match that Jim Cornette will hate. It's just that kind of match. There's not a lot of psychology here. There's not a lot of um, stake. It's mostly sizzle. These guys went out there and did some of the most overly choreographed stuff ever. And yet... It was great. Like, it, it's weird to describe their matches. If you saw the show, you know what I'm talking about. The Young Bucks have been perfecting this art for years. Their matches are extremely unrealistic. Like, nothing about it looks real. Later on in the show, we had a CM Punk Darby Allen match that looked very real. This didn't look real at all. It's like the opposite of the Suzuki John Moxley stuff, right? But for what it was, it was great. It was a tremendous match. They did some of the most, I mean, there was stuff like, there was a, a, a moment where the Bucks had this, like, boot that had, like, thumbtacks glued to it, and they used that for a few, like, different spots. There was a spot where they all went in, like, a circle, super kicking each other. They did all their classic stuff, but this time with the, um, with the, uh, the, the cage, there was a crazy dive from the top of the cage. Um, there was, there was just so much, I can't even remember everything in this match, I'm gonna have to watch it again. I don't think I like this match as much as the Young Bucks versus, uh, Omega and Hangman from last year, but I think this is easily in the top five best AEW matches for the Young Bucks, that I believe it's in the top five. Um, they hit the crazy assisted pile driver and won the championship, so... Finally, the Lucha Brothers are the tag, are the tag team champions. They brought the family out. Great moment. Crazy match. There's going to be some wrestling fans that hate this match. 
If you're an old school fan or if you're a fan of like a traditional style wrestling, you're not going to like this. Or you may love it. But I know some people out there, like I said, the Jim Cornette crowd are not going to like this match. Part of me like didn't like it, but part of me loved it. I'm very split on it because it was so wacky and yet so well done. You know what I mean? Like it's one of those things. So Ruby Soho wins the Women's Casino Battle Royale. Um, Thunder Rosa was the last one she eliminated. It was a, it was one of these Casino Battle Royals. There's not much to really say about it. You know, I was never a huge fan of Ruby Riot. I knew she was a good wrestler, but I was never like a massive fan of hers. And I feel like this is just the next opponent for, you know, for um, Britt Baker. There wasn't too much memorable stuff here. The finishing sequence, though, with Rosa and Ruby on the apron was good stuff. I really enjoyed that. Um, I actually think this match was probably not as good as the Women's Royal Rumble this year, but it was good for what it was. Obviously, the big weak spot with AEW is their women's division. Now, I think that they have been significantly improving since two years ago with their women's division. WWE, though, still has Charlotte, Sasha, Becky, Bailey, Bianca, like, you know, Rhea Ripley, Asuka. Like, their women are just tippy-top in the world, okay? That's one thing WWE has over AEW is their women are the best. But AEW's women are getting better. So it's going to be interesting to see how where, where we go from here. Then we have the final fight, Chris Jericho and MJF. Okay, this was a very emotional match. You had the guitar player from Fozzy providing the instrumental of Judas, and the fans sang the song. Jericho gets in the ring. I really like this match. Once again, I feel like MJF is the future of the business. He's the only guy in wrestling who actually plays his character everywhere. He's a dick heel. He may actually be that way in real life. Who knows? He was so good in this match. They did so much cool stuff here. MJF was slimy. Jericho was the 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 you know vanquishing hero trying to save his career because if he lost this match, he couldn't wrestle in AEW again. MJF went for an acai moonsault, but then gets power bombed into the ring apron, the corner. And that led to him selling his back for the rest of the match. So you actually had psychology. You had a story here. And I like that. I appreciate when they do stuff like this. Tremendous psychology. Because for the rest of the match, MJF is selling the back. Which led to the finish. But before we had the finish, we had a false finish where it looked like MJF was going to win by hitting Jericho with his own bat. Hit the three count. Jericho's foot was on the ropes. Referee comes out and tells the other referee... No, Jericho's foot's on the rope. You missed that. They restart the match. Then Jericho ends up winning, uh, rolling him into the um, the walls of Jericho. And eventually, MJF taps out, and Jericho's career is saved. The inner circle comes down and celebrates with him. Really, really tremendously great match. Um, it was not the craziest match ever, but as far as telling a story went, this told a story. This is about as good as you're going to get from traditional professional wrestling. You had, earlier in the show, the crazy Lucha Hardcore stuff in the cage match, and then you have this, which is like much more of a traditional one-on-one -on -one pro wrestling match. So they ended the show with solid wrestling, but I'm not done. CM Punk, Darby Allen. So Punk really, the atmosphere was really what made this. It's like Money in the Bank 2011. The crowd made this match. Darby Allen did a really good job. They worked what would be considered like an, uh, I'm going to follow me here when I say this, like an epic WrestleMania type match with near falls. You had them all busting out their moves. You had a little bit of scientific wrestling, reversals. It was a mixed bag of stuff, but it was just a good wrestling match. Was it the best match of Punk's career? No, of course not. But for a guy who has not been in the ring for seven years, you really couldn't ask for a better return match because I was worried. I was thinking, okay, is this guy going to be able to hack it? Does he have cardio? Like, I was thinking these things. Like, has he really, like, is he really ready? Seven years is a long time. He did MMA. He did some movies, some comic book stuff. Now he's back in the wrestling ring. Darby Allen did the best he could. Darby Allen really helped Punk. 
he they, they had this awesome spot where Darby Allen went for a coffin drop and then Punk just sat up and then Darby Allen rolled him up for two. Then he went for the last supper cradle. Then Punk pops up, gets the single leg drop kick. You know, like the, the back heel kick or whatever. And then Darby Allen gets on his shoulders, but then Punk adjusted him in midair into the GTS for the one, two, three. And actually earlier in the match, he had a GTS and Darby Allen like slipped out from the from the middle the middle and bottom ropes. That was cool. Um because Punk couldn't pin him there. And then you had CM Punk, the victorious winner, his first match back. He shakes Sting's hand. Who's next for CM Punk? We'll see. Paul White and QT Marshall. I, li- I swear to y'all, I swear to God, me and the people I was watching this match with, or this show with, were able to predict this match move for move. It was the most predictable thing. As they get to the ring, I'm like, okay, the rest of the guys are going to jump in, you're going to get punched, choke Sam, caught from the top rope, literally move for move. This was, in my opinion, placed oddly on this show because it was three minutes before the main event. And I think the reason as to why they did this is because they wanted to give everybody a break so they can go take a piss and buy concessions for the main event. That makes sense. However, if it were me, I would have probably done CM Punk, Darby Allen, and then the main event only because I like the idea of having a show end with a big one-two punch. And then you get this punk moment, then you got the Christian stuff at the end. So to me, that would have been more effective in my opinion. Then you have the main event, Kenny Omega and Christian Cage. Really good match. Um, It's kind of the same thing that we've seen before with the other Kenny Omega AEW heel matches. You know, you had, to me, the Rampage match they had was probably a better wrestling match. This was more of a spectacle for pay-per-view because they busted out some stuff. Early on, they went for, they were going for the V-Trigger and the Kill Switch there was a spot where um, they used tables and at one part um, they um, did like suplexes to the floor. Like they pretty much fought all over the place. There's one moment where Punk, I'm sorry, where uh, Kenny Omega goes for like a moonsault, but he slips and then he does it again and nails it. And Christian hung in there. Like Christian and Kenny Omega have really good chemistry. These guys have great chemistry. This match felt like a very worthy main event. They didn't overdo it with the, um, with the, I guess the dog and pony show. I thought it was fine. I thought it was good. So later in the match, what happens is Christian hits the kill switch after some interference uh, from Gallows and the Good Brothers come out and whatnot. And then Don Callis gets on the. Uh, I thought that was the end, by the way. I, was, I mean, I was like surprised. Don Callis then gets in there. Christian chases him off. He goes for the kill switch, but Omega stops him, goes for the eyes, and hits a middle rope like avalanche one winged angel for the pin. That's the first time Christian's been pinned in AEW. Then we have the big post match finale. This was very interesting the way they did this. So the elite are all beating up Christian. Jurassic Express come out to make the save, but the Elite is overwhelming them. This is like a uh, NWO finish from Nitro back in the 90s. Omega gets the mic and says nobody's on his level. And the only ones who have a chance to beat him are either not here, retired, or already dead. Then the lights went out. Adam Cole's music played. And everybody in the building chanted Adam Cole, baby. And everybody thought that Cole was going to face off against Omega. But instead, he super kicks Jungle Boy, and he swerves and reveals that he's actually with the Elite, that he's friends with the Elite, and that the Elite is the most dominant faction in the history of the business, which is interesting because, you know, he just got there. So, the Adam Cole debut was not originally going to be on this show, neither was the Brian Danielson one. That was supposed to be at the Arthur Ashe show in New York, but it looks like they've made some changes here, and they're going to go with it here, because they wanted to get the most eyeballs to watch Dynamite. So, the Elite's in the ring, then like a remixed version of Flight of the Valkyrie plays, Brian Danielson comes out. He comes in the ring, stands side by side with the Jurassic Express and Christian, there's a big brawl, Danielson hit the yes kicks to Nick Jackson, and then the running knee, 
And then they pose in the ring and the elite was on the ramp and that's how the show ended. So they're building up the elite against Danielson and Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and uh, Christian, and maybe some other baby faces. But now that Adam Cole is in the elite, that could change things around too. So AEW has a really stacked roster right now. And, you know, there's more coming. There's more coming, bro. There is way more coming in the future uh, of AEW. There's, I mean, we don't even know what the status is of Bray Wyatt. We don't even know what the story is with, you know, if he's going to jump over. There's, you know, there's other guys too. Crazy, crazy show. Very much a show for the fans of pro wrestling, the hardcore fans. If you are a hardcore pro wrestling fan, there's a lot to love about this show. Brian, Adam Cole, the main event, the Punk Derby match, the cage match. There was so much good on this show that the only stuff that was really bad, even Jericho MGF was amazing. The only stuff that was bad was a part of the women's casino battle royal. Like some of it was a little sloppy, but what what can you expect? It's a battle royal that that happens, and that's about it. Like the show was entertaining top to bottom. I like that they built up the show to where they had all the big surprises close to the end. Like the second half of the show felt different than the first half. You know, the first half was headlined by the cage match. The second half was headlined by those last four matches. And even though the big show Cutie Marshall stuff was kind of trash, it was just, it wasn't that bad. It was three minutes, didn't really offend anybody. Overall, it was a really good show. Maybe the best AEW show of all time, pay per view wise. I have to think about it because I have to go back and see because I really liked Full Gear 2019 and Revolution 2020. Like, I really liked those shows, but this one may have been right up there. I think. If this one had a slightly stronger main event, it would probably end up being the best. But it was a really good match either way. So, nothing but praise for AEW tonight. Big week for Tony Khan and everybody at the Elite. I have friends that work for that company. And I'm very happy for all of them. And I hope that business does flourish for them. Because they're really trying hard to get that rocket off the ground. What would you think about the show? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching.